So let's just give ourselves a break from the day, sort of transition into the class by just sitting comfortably in a stable, upright position. And, and trying to move our awareness away from our external environment, moving it inside the body and mind. And just try to use the physical sensation of the breath as it passes into and back out of the tip of the nostrils, whatever sensations you can observe in that location, just using that as a way of anchoring your attention in the present, trying to hold your attention, not letting it go to external objects, but also not letting it go to memories or plans. Just trying to stay in the present, using the physical sensation of the breath. When the mind moves into distraction, we just note that that has happened and gently return our awareness that physical sensation. And try to establish a virtuous motivation for your time. Thinking about your own spiritual life, what you're trying to accomplish, and how accomplishing that would be of benefit to yourself, but also to those around you. By developing our qualities, we are able to benefit others more and more effectively. I try to think that that is also part of the purpose of your time. All right. So welcome back. Good afternoon. So we have, um, we have made it to the last of these classes, the last uh, in the series. Um, any that you have missed are on the YouTube channel, uh, Top to Nor Building's YouTube channel. You can find any of the past uh, classes in this series that you might have missed. So if anyone was here, I just always try to start by asking if anybody had been here last week or 
maybe someone did see one of the videos and they just had something that they wanted to, something that we had covered that they wanted to ask a question about or get more information about before we move into new material. Is there anything like that? No. All right. So, as I said, we will be finishing up the material uh, in, in the book. So, as we, as we are now getting to the final points that Lama Yeshi is making in the book, um, he does circle back to the idea uh, in, in the teachings, the idea of what's called emptiness, the idea of, um, you could say, the ultimate nature of things. Um, you know, he does come back to this, and we have looked at this to some degree um, previously uh, in this class. We, I think, mainly when we try to look at this before, we emphasized it from the perspective of developing an awareness of how over time, um, even, you know, even the, over the course of a single day, how we can show up in the world in different ways. And so using an awareness of that, um, meaning, of course, over long periods of time, we can see how we've had certain skills and abilities that have grown, that have changed. We have more capacity uh, in various ways to be able to relate to the world now compared to when we were perhaps much younger. Um, and also our priorities, our interests have also shifted over time. And to use that, to use an awareness of that to get an insight into how, although it's true that we feel very much like there's a, a really, really stable identity that is what has undergone all of that, it's also true that we can soften how we relate to that identity by developing that kind of insight. Um, and again, even, even over short periods of time, uh, even over the course of a single day, we can recognize that how we relate and how we think and process um, is influenced by what has happened, you know, whether we slept well, whether we slept poorly, whether people in our environment were supportive or challenged us, um, and how different parts of our identity are able to be expressed in different ways. So what we've come back to again and again throughout the course is, in a way, the role of introspective awareness and how that is a skill that we can develop. Um, and when we don't develop it, when we are in a more reactive mode, when we're not as, when we're not paying attention internally as closely, that is when we are much more likely to be under the influence of getting hooked by objects of attachment, these things that exist around us that we label as pleasant or unpleasant and then want to bring in or want to remove from our experience. Um, and what underpins a lot of that 
is the stability, the concreteness that we ascribe. Um, and so it is that idea of that concreteness that we can look at. And we did, we have looked at it again in that sort of way that I've uh, kind of uh, encapsulated that we've looked at before and that I sort of um, summed up in a way. But we can also, it is also true, and what Lamieshi does do is we can, of course, this is still the most detailed, most profound and difficult general topic that is in Buddhism. So there's many ways in which it has to be looked at more deeply in other ways, in other times. But, um, but he says is what he starts to say um, is that we it's possible using this introspective awareness to realize that the mind's view of an object is in his, in his word illusory so before when we looked at this in a slightly more general way. So today we'll be looking in a little bit more detail. Um, we can also start to look at this in relation, not just to kind of the varieties of, or the complexity of our identity and using the complexity of our identity to gain an insight into how we might choose not to be so solid about our views. But we can also start to think about just the act of cognizing, the act of perceiving, um, the way in which when we move throughout the world, we're constantly observing all of the varieties of things around us. And what Buddhism will point out about this um, is that in the same way that when we lack introspective awareness about our identity, when we lack introspective awareness about our perceptions, we also take shortcuts in a way um, because it's easier, because we are in a way kind of overwhelmed by the variety of things in our environment. And so these shortcuts are simple and easier, but unfortunately, they're not fully accurate. They're not completely, they don't really give us the full picture. And so we're losing out on being really in tune with how things are because we're relating to them using the shortcut. So here he wants us to think of our perceptions as being illusion-like, as being illusory. Um, but, of course, the worst way that we can misunderstand what is being said here is to think that Lama Yeshi, to think that the Buddha, to think that this way of understanding means that things don't exist, that, um, that this is a nihilistic rejection of reality. That's not what is being gotten at here. What we're trying to develop more wisdom about is that things do exist. We do live in a world 
populated by other people, other phenomena, um, and this way of thinking really isn't isn't telling us anything about those things. What it is trying to tell us about is the way in which we develop knowledge about those things. The process that sentient beings, of which we are an example, the process by which sentient beings, when they perceive, the process by which knowledge is gained, and the things in that process that are these shortcuts that are not, that don't fully get at or don't fully um, understand the object that's being perceived. And the, the import of this is summed up, you know, here where so he used the word illusory, and now he's using words like hallucinating and dreaming, which we've had, you know, he's used this sort of language before in the course. So what he's really trying, I, I think, you know, what he's really trying to help us to see is that we put a lot of trust into this surface level shortcut that we are very familiar with and very accustomed to doing, um, the world of appearances. And it is as if, it is as though we go through the day and Every time that we perceive something, we perceive the label of the object. So we perceive, you know, phones and computers and lights and tables and chairs and books. All of these thousands and thousands of objects that we go through life. It is the label that is what, and I, you know, in a way it's, I think it could be because even just in a room, even just in this room that we're in, there are hundreds of these things, hundreds of these individual objects that all have a label that we have learned over the course of our life. And we know that because it has this label, this is how I relate to it. This is what I do with something that has this label. A book is something that contains words that I open, that I read in a particular way. Um, a camera is an, you know, an electronic device that has a particular function. So we don't go around using books to drink water from. We don't go around using microphones to serve food. It makes perfect sense, you know, that we understand the function of the things that are around us. And, and since there are so many of them, we kind of limit ourselves to all of these labels. But when we do that, we take the sort of subconscious view that these things in our environment, that, that they can kind of broadcast to us their essence. And we then think that not in a, not in a logical or you know, um, intellectual or, or even something that we would, you know, once we think about it and once we reason it out, we wouldn't actually say it, but we go through life 
thinking that, that it is almost as if these things are broadcasting, are able to broadcast their labels to us, and that we are just passive observers, um, and that we are in a way powerless but to observe the labels that we are being presented with by the world around us. And the implication of that, though, in a way, is that when there's chocolate cake in, on the table, then we feel like we have no choice but to relate to it as the thing that makes me happy when I eat it. Um, when there is, you know, a stack of reports for work or when there's our tax return, you know, paperwork on the table and we're not wanting to engage in that activity of having to work through that to engage in that, then we see those objects and we feel like that I am powerless but to think that that is able to broadcast a difficult, unpleasant, challenging, painful experience to my mind because my mind is passive. My mind is just noticing what is there. So what this is getting at is that we're not good at understanding deeply, consistently, all of the time, that when we cognize, when we look at what is around us, we have a great many filters. We have a great many biases and learned and innate ways of filtering what is there and then layering on what is there with a judgment or a value or some sort of um, intellectualized, um, concretized sense on top of it. And what he's getting at here is that this is the process that if we can work with this process, then these objects lose that hold. They lose, if it, if it isn't true that chocolate cake is actually broadcasting pure enjoyment, pure, you know, bliss and, you know, all of the sort of sensory things. And if it isn't true that um, we have no choice but to think of our work and what have you, if, it's, if it is true that our mind is, la is layering on top of the object, then we have the ability to actually change those filters. We have the ability to see things in a different way, to work directly with what we are bringing to the process of perception, um, and then to really fundamentally change how we do perceive um, and what we perceive. Uh, and if we don't do that, what he's suggesting is that we will continue to give up control of that process to what is around us um, if we don't take charge of this process and learn to work with these filters, then we will continue to suffer. We will be kind of in a way at the mercy of 
these, you know, whether or not we're in the presence of these things that we think are pleasant, whether or not we're in the presence of these things that we think are unpleasant, if that's the only mechanism that we have to be content, then we have no real control over the process of contentment. Uh, and he's, what he's getting at here is that we actually do have control. Uh, it's not easy. It's not we don't have control today fully, but we have within us, we have everything that's necessary to move in that direction. Because, and what's important um, is because the words themselves point at what's important here when he says hallucinating and dreaming. These are, you, you can see just from the words, these are states of mind that are not in tune or in touch with what's true in the object. Um, we know that when a person hallucinates, that is an altered state that they can shift out of. Um, when you dream, that's in a way an altered state that you can shift out of. But so that process of shifting out of it is within our control. That is something that we can develop the skills and the abilities to do. Any thoughts or questions so far? You can, you can unmute your, you should be able to unmute yourself if you had. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow we have to be convinced that that's better than the hallucination. And um, I don't know, that's, well, of course it's not easy. We know that. But um, it's, it seems that that's an issue for me and probably other people too, because, the, because that hallucination or the dream has so much in its favor. <clears throat> so that's, that's all. It's just, um, you know, it's just kind of how it is, I guess, my reality anyway. And uh, sometimes it feels like I, I can talk myself into and out of things, uh, <clears throat> but I'm not always convinced that's what I want most. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think I think it's very true that we have been conditioned. Um, I mean, of course, for, it, it, I think one aspect of that is that from the time that we're born, for many years, we just lack the skills to to do much. You know, to make much. You know, we didn't really grow up in a culture that supports that kind of introspective awareness and 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 it's it is difficult it's not the path of least resistance um so and our you know we live in a fast food immediate um gratification sort of culture and view so we we have a, we have internalized i think it's true that we've internalized the idea that sensory pleasure is the end all and be all of what is possible um and that that is as good as it that is as good as it can get um and so if that's true then we should just try to maximize that and of course if that is accurate then then it would make sense that to to just maximize that and try to minimize you know so there's different, I think there are different ways of working with that. One 
is to recognize that our ability to maximize that, even, even in just a purely conventional level, our ability to bring in what we think of as pleasant and what we think of as unpleasant is limited. Um, we're, in a way, also, unfortunately, we're better at it than most humans on Earth because of, you know, being relatively well off and, you know, not having to deal with extreme poverty and the sorts of things that, you know, we do have a greater ability than almost everyone. So in a way, that's an obstacle. In a way, we're separated from certain things that could help us to see. Um, but it isn't. But then, you know, it is really also this path of introspective awareness and recognizing that even on a purely conventional level, I am depriving myself of, you know, because Buddhism doesn't say don't enjoy your life. And that's not what Lama Yeshi is saying in this course. And, but what it is saying is find a mechanism, find a process that actually works. Find a process that's actually truly reliably, consistently effective. And when that process is just trying to bring things in and push things away, then what we're telling ourselves is that I'm not going to be happy most of the time. I'm going to be kind of neutral most of the time. And sometimes I'll be kind of elated, kind of pumped up. Um, and then other times I'll be dejected. Other times I'll be depressed. Other times I'll be really down in the dumps. And that's kind of the side effect of that philosophical view. Um, and what Buddhism is pointing out is that we're cheating ourselves of being able to adopt a philosophical perspective that's consistent and is reliable and gets rid of this view that only when I'm only when I'm pumped up and elated and bringing in the cupcakes and bringing in the, you know, then, then I'm happy. And if, and if I don't do that, then by definition, there's something wrong, something missing. This is about trying to find a deeper, consistent, internal source of contentment and satisfaction that is that exists irrespective of what's being brought in and exists irrespective of what can be pushed out. Um, and so we have, we do have to think it's possible. We do have to think, we do have to have confidence in our ability to, in a way, to do that. But I, I do kind of feel like if we start meditating, you know, five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, um, and we can, we try not to skip, we, we get to a point after a few months where we try not to skip days, then I think we can start to see, well, when I do skip a day, my day is not as good. You know, my, I feel off. Um, cause we will, I mean, of course, even when we become consistent, you know, we'll still skip days. <laughs> That's just the nature of, but we can start to see, and then we're like, well, but why did I skip? Cause it's so, it's so internally, like it's so much fun. Um, it's so calm and, and peaceful. And, uh, so that is a, that's a clue. That's sort of, that's an internal sign that 
that there is this deeper source that we can start to get more and more familiar with. Um, and then once we start to work, and then it's, again, I think all of this is about trying to take certain things as our working hypothesis, which is kind of, you know, Venerable Rabina always kind of talks about, you know, just sort of taking it on board as a working hypothesis and testing it out uh, and then seeing if there's some benefit. And then you're demonstrating to yourself that there's benefit. Um, and then it's just a question of being more consistent and taking it further and further and trying to get those results, get those benefits. Um, and, you know, historical, traditional Buddhism would also encourage us to think about past lives and future lives um, and to perhaps think, well, even if I am really successful in pushing and pulling, is it a missed opportunity to develop skills and abilities that will serve me in even next time, you know, even in future lives, when maybe I don't, I'm not as successful in pushing and pulling things into my experience. And, and really just trying to question the philosophical view that says that this, that this is as good as it gets. Um, Is that kind of a little help, maybe on, on the in the vein of what you were asking a little bit? Yes, yes, that's that's very helpful. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Any other thoughts or questions so far? So again, so this is, you know, again, going back to what I was saying, what Lama Yeshi is encouraging us to do is, you know, of course, Buddhism is not about being miserable. It's not about um, being, you know, depriving ourselves or being miserable. It's about when there is enjoyment in the world, um, being able to experience that in an open, spacious way that sees it for what it is and doesn't need it to be something that it's not, um, that doesn't need, you know, because we start to see through introspective awareness, we start to be able to hold ourselves more lightly, more gently. And then we can start to also think about, you know, the act of perception itself. And what is it that I am bringing to these acts of perception? And of course, it's true that there are things, it is true that um, these things exist, but the way in which they appear to me is in some way unique to me. Um, I might really like, you know, carrot cake. Other people may not really like carrot cake. If carrot cake was amazing, from its own side, we would all agree. We, every sentient being who observed carrot cake would see it as inherently delicious, as from its own side having those characteristics. But the problem is that if the, that those two people, they're both apprehending carrot cake and they're apprehending the same carrot cake, 
and they're apprehending it simultaneously. But one person is having an experience of pleasure. The other person is having an experience of unpleasurability, whatever word you want to use, which indicates that neither of them are fully apprehending what's really there, that they that there is something there, um, but that they are both bringing to their own act of perception a whole bunch of preconceived ideas, things that they've learned, things that they've previously experienced, things that are part of their culture, their unique history in the world, even differences in biology um, that might give rise to different experiences. Uh, and so we can't say, but the problem is that they're both convinced internally, they're both convinced that they're not doing that. They're both convinced that they are relating to the object as it is. But if they were to, if either of them or both of them were to stop and really unpack that and recognize that the diversity of opinions about the same object is a clear indication that that can't be true, then they can have more insight. Then they can develop more perspective and more spaciousness, and more wisdom. And then, with that, by repeating that kind of experience, then in other situations, it becomes easier and easier as we go through life, as we contact various objects, it becomes easier and easier to start to question that subconscious view that is convinced that how this thing is appearing to me is a hundred percent true about this thing outside of me and that it has nothing to do with me, that I bring nothing to the act of perception. Um, we, and again, that isn't something we can all see in hearing the words, in thinking about the examples. We can kind of all see, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that's kind of true. Which is, that is the whole point, ultimately. The fact that just by thinking about it, just by hearing the words, just by looking at some examples, the mind can start to poke holes in that preconceived subconscious view is the whole point, really. Um, because that means that that seed of wisdom is already there in the mind. And we just have to nurture it. We just have to grow it. Um, and so in a way, in terms of this idea of convincing ourselves that we should try, you know, we can think about what Lama Yeshi here is saying, you know, aiming for the experience of enjoyment without that clinging, compulsive, attached, sort of agitated um, neediness that that is the side effect of that subconscious view that's convinced that what I'm perceiving is really everything that is there outside of myself. Um, when we when we start 
to see how, in, you know, just in our own direct experience through thinking about it, through looking at it in a careful way, um, then we can, when there is something pleasurable, we recognize it as, okay, yes, this is something that I enjoy doing. And so when, while it's here, I'll have that pleasant experience. When it goes, it's, it's, that is its nature to go. And I'm not going to think of it as being from its side kind of made out with, you know, that phrase that we've used before, kind of made out of happiness from its own side. And so that spaciousness, that relaxed attitude um, actually just improves the quality of my own life, that that I'm able to add a level of relaxed, spacious enjoyment to my own day-to-day experience. Um, So he points out here, you know, So he's, again, still using these words that are helping us to see what he's getting at, the words like illusion, projection, and fantasy, where we start to have greater wisdom about the difference between this thing that's in front of me that my mind in the first moment of contacting it, in the first moment of perceiving it, my mind, due to lots and lots of past habituation, really does think that it is exactly how I think it is. It has all of the qualities that I believe it to have. And and like a mirror, like a, you know, I'm just noticing that. Um, when we can start to see, well, but I personally am bringing a lot to that, which makes that perception have an illusion like quality, a projective quality, or a, even a fantastical quality to the act of perception. Maybe it's not, maybe it isn't like that. Maybe because so many other people look at this and they disagree with me. They see it in a different way. So maybe I am projecting. Maybe it isn't as solid as I think it is. And when we can practice that kind of awareness, then we open ourselves up to not being limited to only those things, because there's a very limited number of situations and objects that we're going to naturally, spontaneously, in the first instance, perceive as desirable, right? That's, there's, that's a small grouping of things. And up until now, that small grouping of things has kind of been the point. Um, so this is really about trying to see, well, if, if all of my acts of perception are sort of concretized, then concretized in a way that is a bit illusory, that's a bit of a projection, that's a bit of a fantasy, then I don't have to relate to things in that first 
moment of perception. I can see things realistically. I can see things more clearly with more wisdom. Um, and then the things that previously caused me to suffer don't really trigger me in the same way. And then also the things that I thought were so, you know, pleasant, they also don't trigger, they also don't, I, I don't have the same neediness, the same clinging. So then the mind itself, which is sort of the space where all of these things are occurring, the mind itself opens, the mind itself becomes more spacious. The mind itself becomes calmer, more peaceful, more even. Um, and then through doing that, he says, that's how we become more free. That's how we start to experience daily life in a way that's always more fulfilling, always more enjoyable, um, rather than the false view, the mistaken view of today is only going to be good to the extent to which the number of things that I like happen and to the extent to which the number of things that I don't like don't happen. Any thoughts or questions on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a comment, really. Um, you know, I have in particular a friend that I just see how she is uh, operates her life in that way. Um, and she prefers it that way, I think. Um, I mean, by, by her example, anyway, she, she chooses it. And I, I don't know, is there anything you can say? To somebody like that? You know, um, I think, I mean, of course, it's always, I think it's always true that all of these wisdoms are things that, you know, we're meant to kind of just try to take on board for ourselves um, rather than, because, of course, we don't, there's, there's no real hope. Um, we, we, uh, the ability that we have today of changing our own mind is limited, and we have to grow in that. The possibility that we have of changing anybody else's mind is literally zero. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, what people say, though, is that what we can do is to try to act in the world differently. And then we can try to be an example for other people, maybe the people that are around us, if they see that we do things a little bit differently, but we also seem quite contented, then they might take an interest. They might ask us, well, what are you, you know, how are you doing that? What did you start doing? Um, and then we can start to share um, how we are going about that. and. And then maybe, you know, maybe they'll follow or, but it could be that they're just not ready yet. You know, of course, yeah. not everybody's in the same place. Um, and it yeah. takes, you know, we have to be ready to be able to do these things. Um, it's a, we, we have to recognize that about ourselves and be gentle and patient and, yeah. you know, take it slowly day by day with ourselves. And we have to think that way about everybody else too yeah that's that's good and even in your the words that you have to decide 
it's act with humility and wisdom. It isn't like say things of advice, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, thank you. That's absolutely right. So I try to end, I try to end with these really positive, um, you know, these more inspiring things that Lama Yeshi always says. Um, you know, so here, this last piece of advice for the course um, is to try to act with humility and wisdom. So that's what we, and so, you know, again, one aspect of humility too has to do with questioning, uh, questioning our, the way in which we relate to our identity um, and again by by seeing how it has changed over time um, and then also by questioning our acts of perception and by recognizing that we're not really getting it right um, and that to stay open to the fact that you know, we, um, that we hold ourselves in a very tight way, which gives rise to a lot of inflexibility, uh, and that we hold the way that we perceive other things in a very tight way, and that also gives rise to inflexibility. Uh, and that inflexibility is what causes trouble, really isn't things that cause trouble. It is our inflexibility that causes trouble. And the more that we can start to see that, then we don't have to change external things. We recognize that, well, I should find a way of trying to internally shift something. Um, and then, of course, that just is directly related to wisdom, which is observing all of these things in our own experience, over time, we start to really try to see what's true about things. Um, if it is true that 10 people can look at the same thing and come away with 10 different perceptions, then my perception isn't the right one. My perception isn't the only or best or most correct. So trying to learn from others and trying to learn from um, and to learn about how my mind is actively engaged in giving rise to how I see things. And then recognizing that, well, when I change my mind, then the way in which I see things will change. When I, when I develop my own qualities, then the way in which I see things will change. Um, so that's humility and wisdom. And that, you know, to the extent to which we can do that, it will have a direct and meaningful impact on our life day to day to day. And, and then we'll be doing all of the, you know, if we do have an idea of a larger spiritual path, you know, we'll be doing all of the right things. We'll be doing all of the things that we need to be doing to, to use this life in the best, most constructive way to set ourselves up for continued spiritual growth and development. Are there any final thoughts or questions? No. Nope. All right. So sadly, sadly, we have reached the end um, of our time and of the course. So to whatever extent we've participated today or in previous classes, let's just try to recollect 
all of that effort. And maybe if we want to go back and look at some of the recordings, whatever, just thinking about the totality of our effort. And again, recollecting our motivation. Try to think, may whatever positive energy I've created, may that ripen in the best way to support my continued spiritual growth and development. May it cause me to develop my own qualities and may those qualities be able to benefit other sentient beings by working on myself, may I be able to be of greater service, greater benefit. So trying to just give away our effort, not grasping, offering it for the benefit of all. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Have a lovely uh, Chochul Juchen if you're going to celebrate uh, Chochul Juchen. And uh, 